accomplish with HCA, Healthcare America. And Alan is going to help me do that. And he's going to say a few words about himself. So thank you, everybody, for uh, having us back. Thank you, Guru. Uh, pleasure to be back. Uh, my name is Alan Scott. I work at HCA. And as Guru said, I got sick on the plane flight in. I blame it on the perfume lady, though. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm the Enterprise Integration Architect for HCA, and this year we wanted to come back and we actually wanted to talk with everybody about something that was very critical and what we believe is a strategic importance for our organization, which is how do you innovate while having your current project load that you're dealing with? Because that's a topic that I talk with a lot of companies about, and they give me great feedback. So when we talked with Guru, we said, how can we do something unique? Now, what this session is, this isn't a how we do things great and everybody doesn't. It's also not meant to be a Tony Robbins motivation speech. Why not? And it's not meant to be a Dr. Phil event either. But what we're trying to do is kind of explain how we've done, and everything you're going to see is actually things that we've achieved. So it's not like panacea. Before we start, though, like I did last year, lawyers always have to speak first. HCA, we're a big organization. We're talking to you about how we do things. We're not recommending that you buy it, but we're merely talking about how we use it to accommodate our business needs. Who is HCA? Those of you, so there might be a lot of you that know us, that don't, I want to at least intro us. We're a very big hospital organization, founded in 1968. As of this year, we've got over 165 hospitals, 115 surgery centers, freestanding EDs, clinics, physician practices in 20 states, and we're international in England. Our 2013 numbers, census of 22,853 people per day, 5% of all US healthcare happens at some entity associated with HCA. And I think a key thing that's important to me is 85% of our facilities are recognized by the Joint Commission for providing top performing facilities. Todd? <laughs> okay, so a lot of you were at the summit last year, right? Does, can anyone remember some of the numbers that we uh, mentioned last year as far as some of the volumes that were pushing through this hospital? Let's see, one hand. Uh, where's Tom? I was going to say nine hands, but he's out. Okay, so we're going to revisit those numbers. Um, so we're going to show you some new numbers as well. So on the hardware platform, just to kind of recap, it's on VMware 5. We have five dedicated hosts, and this is a kind of a PSX cluster. Yes, we much prefer Hyper-V, but you know, sales guys are working on it. Um, uh, the SSO servers work, our BISOC servers, and some really good, beefy SQL server, uh, uh, SQL server environment supporting this uh, whole clinical uh, locator management environment. Key thing to note is that our largest BISTOC VM does not exceed 4B proxy 60 yes. gigabyte. Key thing is you're looking at everything you're going to see today. Let's All take, go ahead. Let's take, let's take a look at that next slide. See if it's okay. So this should look very familiar to everyone, right? 23 million average daily volume messages. Note in the lower right corner, we have four BISTOC server groups, nine BISTOC servers per group. But every once in a while, HCA has something happen and they can push through nearly 50 million messages in a single day. 50 million. Anybody surprised by that? Now we've all been working with this talk server for many, many years. Some even back to 2000, 2002, like Devin, maybe. Um, that's an impressive number for this top server. It really, really is. That is an impressive statistics overall. And this was accomplished with a product that we all work with, we all love it, we all enjoy working with it, um, and it's just fantastic. No resources involved. Five developers, three support admins. Pretty, I mean, think about it. Pretty impressive. It really, really is. And as you look at these, how many I know y'all do support products and everything else. How many tickets do you think our BizTalk system generates on an average daily basis? Throw it out 
Yes. Yes. Anybody? Anybody? Just guess. At least zero. Zero? Zero. Zero is pretty close. Yes. yes. Yeah. Will we get between five and ten? In a really bad day when someone doesn't do what they're supposed to, it goes higher. But we have had days where we've had 1,900. So I'm not going to tell you that <laughs> issues don't happen. Sure. The other thing to note is that there's three support people. And one of the key things as we set up this platform, as you heard me talk about last year, and we carried it through, is we don't build support where we're not looking to keep people employed looking at screens and hitting next, next, next. So that, that was a key thing for us to keep going was keep our staff on the capability side or the development, not keep them on the maintenance side with support. And we're also growing some of our support resources as developers as well. So what do we do in 2014? 2013, when we sat here, we all talked about what, where we believed we were going to be. And then as fate would have it, things happen. 2014, we started anew by looking at everything we did and challenging ourselves. We know we're the biggest. Candidly, we have, we have a, another integration engine, which we're the biggest at. So this wasn't news to us. But the question is, how do we do it to enable capabilities? The first place we started was we looked at the HL7 Developer's Guide. Everybody's seen that that does healthcare, right? I would encourage you to look at the one we've done because we actually took people through it. Todd was very instrumental in that, and we ran them through stem to stern what it actually means from a healthcare perspective, not an adapter perspective. Who cares about this talk? No offense, but it's an actual industry perspective overlaying the information of why it's important to do this way for BizTalk. We also developed and published two critical design patterns within BizTalk because our goal is to maximize everything we do, but it's also to ensure and enable that we can continue to use these products and enable our development community at HCA. Along with that, we realized there were some holes that we had to fill. Guru and I had several candid conversations about what we would do and how we would leverage what we needed to do. And we opted to try it ourselves. So we built four, HL7, or MLLP messaging only. We'll talk about that one later. Teradata, anybody here use Teradata, Matizo, Big Data Appliances? PostgreSQL, that was out of necessity. Don't ask. And the most critical one which we wanted to build was an in-memory data adapter. The reason that's critical for us is that we move so much data and we do so many things with that. We wanted to have the ability to have things in memory for faster processing. So that was very mission critical for us. We also de designed and developed three BizTalk specific platforms that are all net new. We also went and redesigned all of our platforms for 2013 R2, which will enable our future growth and our business enablement strategy as we go forward. So th this was critical for us because right now we're sitting in two BizTalk environments. We've got X servers in 2010, we've got X servers in 2013. So we've got, we have a developer set that's actually has multiple VMs that they might be using for development, for version control. We all know how much fun that is, right? Build management, great stuff. And think about it, Alan. The, when you go from 2010, 2013, 2013 R2, you know, that, you have to have a big project around that to the size of your organization, the size of your environment. Think about all the planning that has to go into an ACA, considering the size and sheer volume. I mean, this environment is 24 by 7, constantly processing data. So a lot of thought and planning, we have to be very critical about everything we do and everything how we plan it, because it's going to impact pretty much everything within that organization that is processed through this environment. We also said, and that's true. We, we also said as a foundation, you know, we, we ask other vendors, hey, can you do this? And it's rather re weird because we don't do it ourselves. So we had to eat our own cooking and we actually had to have an API and an SDK strategy where we could give resources, a toolkit and say, here you go. If you want to connect to BizTalk and do things, here's a layer. If you want to do a data access tier, here's a layer. And we had to physically start and look at build those because 
we knew as we accelerate, and as, as you'll see by the numbers, as we continue, we're going to get caught in a situation where we might not be able to address that need. And that's the last thing you want. As everybody knows, for any platform, be flat-footed. We're like, I can do that for you. I just have to go build another 72 servers. You know, and no. So as we did that, what came out of that? As I said, the three platforms. We filed provisionally eight patents this year. There's another two pending to bring us up to 10 on all the biz talk work we've done. And then we also said we have to design and develop enterprise services to work with our customers and clients and our business stakeholders and our systems. How are we going to do that? So we started down the road of let's just use .NET, let's set up IIS, and let's see how that goes. And that went abysmal. So, what we said is, wait a second, if I have a BizTalk application, and I can build a structure, and I can deploy that, if I deploy that as a WCF application, who cannot use that? The answer has been, no one. They just have to be able to get to it. <laughs> On top of everything else, one of these platforms that we did, one of the Microsoft Health Users Group for EMR, which is our FX platform. Those are our new numbers. Anyone surprised by those new numbers? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. yes. Um, I'm just standing back in my corner. Um, look at that lower right corner again. Five desktop groups, seven servers per group. And for those partners out there, one message box per group. On. Thank you. One of the things we did when we looked at our design patterns, we came up with this, is we said, and Guru, it was colorful, more colorful language than this, but we're not adding. Um, so it needs to work. And we're not doing stuff outside of BizTalk, because why do I need BizTalk if you tell me to keep doing stuff outside of BizTalk, right? So when we did this third group, what you need to understand is there's one group here that only has four servers. He's doing what we call entity processing. 30 million transactions in that group happen daily. When he's down and he comes back up, we have yet to have a situation where he's failed and he will process 2,400 transactions at peak. Now, just everybody says, oh, wait a second, I know you're doing that dirty little trick where you do batch inserts. No. That trick gets us 8,000 transactions a second. Now, mind you, when I turn that on, I have to turn my phone off because the DBAs will call. <laughs> because you, it's the first time I've ever seen 40 core boxes really spin on the SQL side. Yes. Any quick questions on these numbers? I, mean, I look at them, I'm still trying to go on um, and you absorb this because this is very, very impressive. Really, think about it. It's extremely impressive what this software, what this engine can do. Okay, Tom. <laughs> We're just checking here. These are angels. So these no. Are no. Not, not 100%. 100%. No. The, the majority. So I always get this question when I talk to everybody. And I was on a phone call a couple weeks ago, and people were questioning how I count, which is always fun. But I swear I did graduate in fifth grade. But the way we do it is we count a, an event in BizTalk as volume, as not what the message box is doing. Because our message box gets hit over 300 million times a day. We know that because we have heavy bound orchestrations. What we count it as is if I have a clinical event that comes in with HL7, and that needs to do 25 things, that becomes 25 messages. Because those 25 things are going to SQL Server, they're going to Teradata, they're going to files, there can be FTP. Because remember, we, we're intense on business rules. So those true messages have a true disposition other than point-to-point pass-through. The other thing I think it's good to note is if you look at these numbers, 12 developers, because we're a project-focused organization, most of those are source partner resources. So our developer headcount has only increased a few. But I didn't want to dissuade that. That's a true number that we have of resources doing work. 
So the other thing we talk about is design for performance. One of the things Todd and I usually talk about between the hours of 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. is performance on BizTalk. And what we want to do and sure we do is design everything for performance because what do we know? The industry demand is not getting smaller. The need is getting more increased. And the more capabilities we add, the more people say, what else can you do for me? So when we put forth HL7 messaging only, we really had to think about how we did that. And one of the things we wanted to think about was how do existing products do it today that effectively are broadcasting HL7 messages? So that's kind of the model we went after. In doing that, in BizTalk 2013 or 2013 R2, with a true adapter, we're getting 107 transactions a second. That is end-to-end, -end acknowledged system, processed through BizTalk, this talk knows nothing. Now keep in mind, if you want to apply a map or something, that's where that would get interesting. Entity processing. How many people in here use BizTalk, use .NET and interact with BizTalk on a daily basis? Lots and lots, lots, and lots of people. Go up. <laughs> Great. One of the things we said, because of volume and constraints, is we need a way for developers to build objects assert them to BizTalk, and have BizTalk do what it does best, which is process. I don't need to build things in BizTalk to do that, but what I need is a way to do that. Previously, in our decoupled architecture, we had the model in place. So what we ended up doing is, and any of you that are familiar with .NET, is we have a very simple model. You build a class, you compile the library, you generate that as an XSD. You then go into BizTalk, XML disassembler, attach your structure to it, guess what? With MSMQ or some of the queuing technologies, you are processing messages in a decoupled manner. We've proven that time and time again through numerous projects. It is an enabler for our organization. Doing that with .NET developers that don't know anything about this talk, they don't want to care, the only thing they do is check their code in, we build their DLL for them, and then we do all the work on the other side, 2,200 transactions a second low volume number. The other thing we had to do is Teradata is a big part of our enterprise. Very important. Data warehouse, we use it a lot. Couldn't understate how important it is. We had no way to get to Teradata from BizTalk. We were really candidly suffering as to how we can get data out of Teradata because ETL tasks, as everybody knows, are great, but you're about four hours behind the eight ball. Plus, you're using three or four other technologies you can't control. So what we focused on was how can I build a native adapter in BizTalk so that I can get to Teradata. Mm -hmm. We achieved that very simply. We built a line of business adapter, you install the .NET SDK for Teradata, it plugs in, you set a few parameters, processing Teradata messages. That is our average rate that we get from Teradata. Our performance metric was a million messages when we tested. We not only tested it once, unfortunately, we screwed up and tested it three times. But nonetheless, that number is held very consistent for us. And just so everybody understands, that's not coming into BizTalk. That is through BizTalk to its final destination. Any questions? So what we do is we tell we tell developers, because we also want to remain consistent, please don't develop in Visual Studio 2008, 2010 or better. And then when, when they're done, we basically do nothing except xsd.exe, the path to that DLL, and an output directory that ends up in our BizTalk project. No one knows the difference. We pick that file up with an XML disassembler component, we put it in, we can do this dynamically or hard-coded into our BizTalk application, and we are processing XML messages. Why is that? Because if I write to a structure in MSMQ with .NET, it puts it into MSMQ as an XML event. So why would I not use the power of BizTalk with, with its native standard of XML? I want to make sure. 
Wow. <laughs> well, next year our focus is with our enterprise redesign implemented, but we, we wanted to look at how we're going to do that. And candidly, we also wanted to have four offerings or five offerings for BizTalk for our people. Because right now we have this giant, enormous footprint that you have to have to run BizTalk, and that's not cost effective. So we actually wanted to come up with three or four different models. Dare I say, as the big guy in the room, it was kind of like the McDonald's. I'd take a number one and I'll supersize it. Or you might say, I'll just take the number three because I don't want to eat that much. But we needed that offering. We also wanted to make sure that we have some of our high profile projects that will be leveraging BizTalk. And that the other part is that we have now transitioned from, since we have all the interfaces for HCA pumping through except new systems, how do we now service orient that data? How do we make it reusable? How do we change the Ableton paradigm for HL7? Because what you guys have is you have a message that comes through that's a clinical event that says, Alan Scott got sick. So we need to order a lab for him. We don't look at things that way. How do I service enable that event so that if Alan Scott got sick, I might be able to notify his doctor. I might be able to turn around and say, well, wait a second. This other thing needs to happen for Alan Scott. I might want to refer him to one of our other centers. All those things that can happen based on just a simple HL7 transaction. So we're really focused on services development and building that infrastructure out with BizTalk and enabling that. Again, because what BizTalk gives us is that back-end scale. This is a fun one. We, we, Al and I actually had long conversations because my first he said, hey, I want to do this. My first question was, why? Honestly, what? But it works and it's beautiful. It really is. So, everybody knows in healthcare, images flow through systems, right? What kinds of things happen? Last year we did a POC with pretty intense volume, and we're actually able in BizTalk to stream a real time image not something that has to be reconstructed as one, but an actual image through BizTalk from 50K to 17 meg through BizTalk natively and route that to many different sources. Again, standard native BizTalk. And Todd standing right over there said, I don't believe you did it. So it was actually a fun demo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then the next part is, like I've said, business rules have become more and more and more important for us as every week and month go by. Because as we know, if you're in the healthcare industry or any industry, rules, regulation, business requirements, they can all change quickly. You don't want to have to be redeploying code. So we will continue our focus to grow and expand our enterprise capabilities in a clinical area and in others at doing business rules processing. More numbers. So, anyone surprised? Anyone who does not believe? As ever, everybody is taking note, there's two things I'll tell you. Please remember that's projected. <laughs> Please. Um, I don't know where Todd got 150 from, but okay. okay. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the one that holds true from a budgeting and concept perspective is number of servers, number of groups. Because, and if you look at the adapters, we're extending ourselves on, on the service, well, for some reason the service is not there. Our service lines and our database connectivity is where we really believe a big expansion will be. Because what we're gonna do is keep enriching that information and keep doing additional things with it as the businesses need them. Are there any questions on that previous slide before we go over here? Because again, okay, we got <laughs> think about it, looking at the size of HCA and what they're processing, it's important that we actually have to step back and try and figure out what these projections are. Because if we're off, you know, by five million, that's pretty significant in HCA's case. So we've got to be as close as we possibly can and very thorough in our projections. Those um, uh, numbers for messages, is that incoming only or is it incoming and outgoing? It's incoming and outgoing. We have, we are to a point where the MMC doesn't function most of the time. So
So I think last time when we talked with Guru and Harsh, we were 2,800 objects in a group. Yeah. We have that many systems. So, and we've had to develop coping mechanisms because when someone says, oh, I need to stop something, we used to be able to right click, you know, all that fun you do, right click on there, stop it. Now we had to parameterize it because we'll never find it in time. Yeah. Our sales have been very active for the yeah. administrators. That way, certain, only certain inbounds um, need to be shut off in certain circumstances. They don't have to globally shut everything down. They can be very, very selective based on the inbound or outbound or destination system. They can turn those off. If they want to ask a question. What does your test environments look like? Oh, okay. Bigger than most production environments. <laughs> oh, Mikhail, <laughs> baby. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the best part is one of the things that we're working through a patent is we actually built our own test platform. Because, you know, one of the things, because I hear this from people, you have the luxury because your data doesn't change. I don't know who thinks that. You have 2,100 different connections, hundreds of deployments of HIS systems, patches going in to meet government rules and regulations, things that happen, so our data never really is the same, but if people want to feel that way, that's okay. So what we have to do is come up with a way where we could test everything in a rolling manner. Seven by 24, so when we put something out there, we know it shouldn't fail with yesterday's data. Yep. Not like, oh, let's go last month, because that makes me feel good. So we actually automated and built all that. That's yeah. what I have and believe it. Identification. <laughs> And believe it or not, this might sound crazy, BizTalk is the, uh, the harness behind that. We actually hand files off for BizTalk to go SFTP, bring in, move. He is the mover behind the scenes for us that does all that. We're moving to an eventing model to where there's an engine there that knows what it has to do. It's just what request is here, what request am I processing, where am I going to get data? We didn't want developers to have to code that. Why should they? BizTalk can do all that for me, that's insanity. What did I do when I did that? I got guys at no.net now falling in love with BizTalk. They're like, wow, that was simple. Right? So that answer your question, though? Yeah. And that platform is going to become more and more mainstream. Hold on one second. Uh, I have one question. I understand between slides 4, 2, and 30, and one is the database connections. It's 24, down 24. Uh -huh. Is that? Uh, so, So we have, under our purview that I'm aware of, and I'm going to use that very specifically, four databases that are SQL, that, that people have ETL processes. We have a very specific thing where I'm not going to go connect to some random system on some Unix AIX thing. You're not going to hang our environment that way, thank you very much. So we make people come to us. But the advent of doing that is we have four different databases that have between two and three billion transactions. Any day of the week. And they run jobs that prune them every day. But by doing that, I keep stuff off of BizTalk. I don't have to take the ownership of poor systems. But what I do have to work with is the DBAs, because that's an extra necessity that we've, we've kind of had to build in. But if we remember the good design pattern of BizTalk is get stuff in, get the heck out. Right? That's, a, that's kind of our mantra. That answer your question? Yes, sir. Um, on your slide for 2014, you showed that you had five BizTalk groups. Uh -huh. Is that the same as um, five BizTalk host instances? Oh, God, no. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. We, we don't even count those anymore. To be honest, I'm serious. We don't. We don't. We don't. Yeah. That, that just it gives me a headache. Oh, wow. No, I mean, um, last, last year, you could probably find slides. Last year, yeah. I think we actually took a number of Last year, we had 1,200, I think, was the yeah. number, and we just kind of. Because you remember in this talk, right, the standard thing is you can't have, you can't not have things isolated and you have to have hosts for specific things. But you also can't have too many hosts because guess what? You saw our footprint, 16 mega RAM. How do I put all that? That's like four pounds of bologna in a half a pound bag. So we have to be very diligent about how we do it. And we've had to isolate those down. You recall from last year, I mean, Microsoft provides, provides guidance on how you scale out your talk environment, how you scale out your hosts, you know, my stand hosts, and then just host for receiving, just host for processing. Um, the first one we had to go through the HCA, 
Well, we needed a host for each message type. That was our starting point. Not a lot. <laughs> a lot, a lot of us in this group in there. One last question. Where are yeah. What do you do when the target system is not available? Oh, God, we pray. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm serious. We, 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 we have one system that is not thought of highly in integration services because it has this, let's say, just capability to be highly unavailable. <laughs> so <laughs> no, they, they've achieved that with great success. So what we've had to do is, to be candid, we've had to build coping mechanisms that we've had to learn how to throttle so that we can actually stop. We actually use throttling instead of turning off connections. So what we'll do is we'll actually throttle the system, let it wait for 15 or 20 minutes, because that will give someone time to get to a computer or a phone, figure out what's going on. So we do a lot of that. We do backup adapters. I think the one thing I wanted to make sure everybody understands is every connection inside of our environment, every single inbound connection is not throttled. We've got one more question. He's been waiting patiently. Yeah, let's ask it. Uh, maybe you're looking a little bit more towards the future. Uh, currently, you're running version two. Now, I don't know if you're running uh, three, version three or CCA, CDA or what. Uh, but have you considered in the future uh, HL7 Fire? So, some of those projects for next year. Some of the things we're being asked to do because of the innovation and the capabilities we have are actually evaluate if we could do those potentially. So it's not that we're considering, we know they're there. Um, and you know, we, we're actually becoming a very active in the HL7 community because we need to get way ahead of that curve. So it's on our roadmap, we've actually done testing with it. Um, but candidly, it's all been in 2013 R2. Right now we sit mostly in 2010. Yeah. All right. We'll talk about how you innovate. Yeah, a little bit more. So again, we got a cool how, demo at the end. That's why I want to make sure we have yeah. time for this. Really how, cool how do we innovate, right? This is, and, and like I said, this isn't a Tony Robbins event. This is a how did we look at what we did, what we did right, what we did wrong, and how do we change the way we actually deliver integration? And just so we're clear, it wasn't selecting this talk, so <laughs> it took a lot. But these are statements I hear from people. You can't innovate in the integration space. I almost have a heart attack every time I hear that one. I don't have the right requirements to do anything. If only with whatever you want at the end of it. It's anybody, just, anybody not here one of these? It's just integration. There's no way to ask what, you know, there's no way to do what they're asking. So we heard, we heard all those inside and outside HCA. And I must say, I spent a lot of time outside HCA actually talking with other groups that are not healthcare because we continue to learn a lot from all the industries. What became clear to me is you have to have an enterprise application integration ecosystem. An integration engine is gone. If you have one, you can do source and target, but you cannot offer capabilities without an extensive amount of work, and then more importantly, rework. In order to, to do that correctly, you must have a strategy that surrounds that. It's not enough to say, oh, I want to use BizTalk to do all my enterprise application integration. Trust me, I did that. That didn't go well for a while. You have to really take a step back and look. You have to become disruptive. You don't, you know, gone are the days where you integrate. Now is the time to innovate. Because it's, it's not enough to move a message between two systems. Anybody can do that, right? That's kind of the expected norm. You also want to build, we wanted to build enterprise solutions, not project-based solutions. And the reason for that is projects can extend those offerings, but if that's where I start, I can't go any further. Because what happens? I always have to go back to a project owner and ask permission for something. So I'm not in the driver's seat. I'm not able to innovate because I have a project owner that doesn't want to take that risk, doesn't candidly might not know what I'm asking for, or says no. You have to identify integration support where. Anybody know what that is? It's the stuff that you do that you constantly have to sit and maintain. It's someone's job to restart that guy all the time. Where's Joe? Because we have to restart that thing. You have to identify those. And the biggest one is you have to identify the assets that you have. 
And candidly, this isn't a slogan, this is what we do. People are our number one asset. And computers, you know, computers make things, but they only run the code that you guys develop. A computer's a great thing, but do you think anything would run on it if a person didn't write the code? And then recognize data. That's your hidden gem in an organization. You know, challenge as to why do you need an ETL process to go grab that data? Why do you need to go over there? Why can't I deliver that for you? If I give you 80% of what you want, why do you have to go over there? Because why wouldn't you go over there and just get the 20%? So, again, change the direction. Remove it's just from your vocabulary. Don't listen to, we've always done it this way. And remove system names from product conversations. Uh, I need to make sure I implement McKesson, I implement CERN, I implement that, I implement SAP. No. We focus on data. What do you need us to do to get that data? Because if you do that, you've now built a platform and a solution. And you start to enable by doing that, what else do you need to do with this data? Right? Because we know you want to move it between two systems, but good Lord, there's got to be something else you want to do with this information. Where do you think in 2015, 2016? And the last one I tell that we've cut out um, on campuses, we don't use buzzwords. We use the heck out of acronyms, but we do not use buzzwords. Because I talk to people and I have no idea what they're talking about five minutes in. But I, I got to go Google a bunch of buzzwords. And the last thing, and it strikes some people as wrong, but it's what we know to be true, is you don't necessarily need more resources to be effective. What you need is that strategy, that platform, that ecosystem, and those patterns that you can make repeatable. And you're not, you're not going to somebody to negotiate how you're going to do something. That's, that's your job to know. What you're looking for them to do is how they would like that data. I don't want to do favorite work. So how do we do this? We have firm, and when I say firm, it was very firm, resolution that we had to identify and change the course we reevaluated how we did this talk very strategically. Because it's easy to have a, a, a platform and say, we're going to use this talk for everything. That, that's a big statement, and categorically, that's wholly wrong. So you have to reevaluate what you're doing and look at the technology strategically. How is it going to benefit this effort, but my next five projects? And if I do something wrong here, by the time I get to Todd's effort, am I really recoding the universe? Because I don't want to do that. We ensure we recognize the assets for everything they do. All those patents we mentioned, they might say HCA, but the developers are named in every single one of those patents. It's work they did. It's hard work that they did. They deserve that. And data, that's our hidden jewel. So we spend an awful lot of time ensuring that the organization understands what we have to offer and what we can bring to the table with our information. We've also had to implement new mindsets. A lot of times, everybody wants to say, well, I can't do anything until I have all the requirements, but my boss is telling me to be agile, right? We've implemented, and we're still getting there, a fail fast mentality. Now, mind you, some days, it's kind of like watching somebody tie their shoes together instead of on each foot, flop over, but it is the mindset. We would rather have people fail fast so that they know what to do with a business owner not by themselves, but with a business owner. Agile development is a standard. That's not an expression. It's not, well, we have five minute scrum sessions in the morning. I ask the three stock questions that I Googled. No, it's, we actually have agile development. You start. Nothing takes longer than a few days to deliver. Nothing. All these solutions we did, we, all, we, we don't do two, three week sprints. We do day sprints. Because our goal is to see what we can. It's not to overwork people, but it's because we know we've got the right design pattern, the right technology in place. And lastly, we make sure that we engage in industry and technology 
other people because we want to hear what others are doing. Because even though we might be the biggest in healthcare, we've learned more from talking to non-healthcare customers than we could have ever planned to. And initially, I, I gotta be honest, I was the first one that said that sounds nuts. But we've learned a lot from the way they do business and they have to do business, and it's actually helped us. The last thing you gotta do is create a demand for work. I mean, you guys do great stuff. I mean, Bill, I've seen your stuff for years, you know? It, but if you're not, it, it, it's like advertising. Why do people spend a million dollars at the Super Bowl? Because people are watching, right? You guys have to be first and foremost to show your work. That's what we instill in our people. And you have to work tirelessly with business owners to let them know this is what we're doing. It might not be right, you might not like version one, but this is how we're gonna do it. Because an engaged business owner is someone that can evolve to work with you. Because you know what they see? They see forward progress. If you give somebody, they give you their requirements and six weeks later you come back with something, it's awful if you miss a few points versus 48 hours later. What do you think about this? Huh, okay. I mean, it's a much different conversation. And then I always demo everywhere. Bring your laptops with you, bring your machines with you. Demonstrate what you're doing to everybody. Because first off, they'll know you're busy. Second off, they'll, they, they might give you feedback that might stop it at, you know, if you're going down the wrong direction. And it also gives you that perspective of getting other people's opinions. And I always tell people, increase the team meetings and interactions help immensely. Because the teams meet, and once a day in that usual four or five question thing, but then every team member will go to the other team member's room. They write on whiteboards, they're writing on glass doors. I've seen it because they write on my office walls when I'm not there, and that's fine. Because we want to encourage that, you know? If you've got an hour to do something with a team member and you have a question or you have an opportunity to learn something, that, that should be taken advantage of. All right. One of our innovation things you guys heard about was FX. So the short history with FX is this, and who in here is, does healthcare? Okay, good. Wow. <laughs> It's good. Everybody knows about meaningful use if you're in healthcare. State and government, and those of you that don't, the, the real simple thing is the state and federal governments have mandates requiring reportable conditions now. They want to know if there's an outbreak of X, Y, or Z. And they want it reported. And they want it reported electronically, right? The reality is when we looked at the platforms, there were no existing solutions out there that could do what we were looking to do. With such a big company, that concerned us. Then every state had different requirements, which really concerned us. And then the third thing, no consistent business reporting requirement whatsoever. Florida wants something here. Florida also wants you to send it to Broward County, the patient's there. It doesn't have to be the same. There's no industry standard message. But we're going to tell you what we want, and that will change. So when we looked at all the options. We said we had to build a solution that's not a solution, but a sustainable platform. Because MU2 is gonna happen, then MU3 will occur, and on and on and on. So if you look to the right here, it's old, it's dated 08 for Florida, but you'll kinda see what we're up against. All these are considered reportable conditions. I believe if you get to the red, you're just in real big trouble. Yeah, smallpox, bison, yeah, if you get to those, you're just you're in bad shape. But they wanted to know every single one of these. And notice, the requirements are dramatically different. Some are between an age range, some are greater than an age range, some are result driven. We had no way of knowing. When, when we looked at the, what was out there, there were a few vendors that had something that we were gonna have to jointly build with them. So we made the decision to go build it ourselves. The overall cost savings, $6 million. The solution was built and Drummond certified in five months, ground up. A team that built it, one business analyst, two developers, and one integration testing resource. I can't quantify ongoing savings, and I'm gonna be candid with you, because we're still in the middle of our full rollout, but I will say that this system prevents 
so many reports from having to be run and so many clinicians from sitting there doing Power BI like you saw before and all those other things. It's now automated for them. Maybe Our this is driving this? Well, we haven't gotten that far yet. Oh. Our implementation, in 11 months to this presentation, we've done 130 facilities. Now that's not just, hey, we hooked them up and they're hooked in and they're happy. That's actually, we've actually achieved meaningful use compliance. MU2 compliance, this, in less than 12 months. And in case you're wondering how big is your implementation staff, go back to the developers. Those, those are the guys doing it all. A resource per facility is putting rules in. So what does the system look like? Data flows in. You'll see the nice BizTalk logo on your left, left here. And you'll see up there, there's the FX logo with a ASP.NET web UI. People use the business rules engine, don't even know they're using it because it's built in an ASP.NET web app. It drives everything to FX data services, which is our gatekeeper to our SQL database. And when a message comes in, it goes through four states. It's, con it's connectivity, it's event identification, we classify the rules that we're going to execute on that data, and we process it. Everything happens dynamically. Nothing gets kicked out for review. None of that happens. So anybody that knows clinical messaging, how are you able to build a rule engine on top of BizTalk that looks at every OBX to look at what code, name, age, test value data? That's what we did. Then dynamically, at the bottom here, it chooses how many places that message is going. Because again, we build platforms, not projects. Our intention is that when Ebola came out, we were ready to go in 15 minutes with Ebola. Um, I, we were ready. Because we, had, we could have rules in place based on that data that's flowing today to notify people. The current technology footprint, it's BizTalk 2010. Um, so obviously you get all the things that come along with it. Server, the business rules engine, which is a giant component of this. SQL Server 2008, we do use some SQL reporting services just in case people want to know what their systems did. The web app runs on IIS. Um, we have some .NET Windows services that do all of our rules, engine movement, and management in case there's a blip or a problem. Future of the product, we've already tested it in 2013 R2. Um, we've, we're going to SQL 2014 with it. There's some notion of potential in-memory pieces, but none of that's firm yet. But notice the big thing that we're talking about here is we're talking about REST API. Again, enhancing through BizTalk. That's all going to be set up for BizTalk for forward facing. I, I might not use something, but if I've got a mobility platform and I need to connect to it, I can do that because of something I've enabled in BizTalk. So I don't care who the vendor is, what the system is, I've, I've now got a REST API that they can either hit or I can drive data to them. And then foundationally, Windows workflow for some tasks and long running items that users and people are kind of running into, just to make sure those are categorized. 